exploring how community-based research empowers marginalized communities, part one of three. This part is called developing a culturally appropriate Aboriginal parenting skills assessment tool. This is the first um, webinar of our second series and they're hosted by Community-Based Research Canada or CBRC. My name is Jessica Dick. I'm the program coordinator for CBRC and I'll moderate today's call. Um, I have a, a bit for you before we hear from our presenters. Um, did want to note that this webinar is being recorded and will be available online after we've finished here today. As a bit of an introduction to CBRC, um, our mission is to address real societal problems through research as a national champion and facilitator for community-based research and campus community engagement in Canada. For 10 years, CBRC has brought together key players of community campus partnerships. Our network builds capacity for academia and broader communities to collaborate and use research as a tool to mobilize community participation and action. And today we're going to be hearing from Charlotte Lopi and Kendra Gage, and I wanted to share a bit of their bios with you. So Dr. Charlotte Lopi is a professor in the School of Public Health and Social Policy. She's the former director of the Center for Indigenous Research and Community-Led Engagement, or CIRCLE, and she's the current research lead for the Faculty of Human and Social Development at the University of Victoria. Her research partners have included individual First Nation communities, regional and national Indigenous organizations, as well as provincial and national government stakeholders. She has undertaken research and published in the areas of Indigenous HIV AIDS, social determinants of Indigenous health, racism and cultural safety, Indigenous ethics and research capacity building, as well as the sexual and reproductive health of Indigenous women. Kendra Gage is the Executive Director of Holiton Family and Community Services Society. She has worked in the field of social services since 1996 in both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal not-for-profit organizations. Kendra is passionate about high standards of practice, CARF accreditation, accountability, youth issues, and most importantly, making sure the voice of, Ab of the Aboriginal community is heard within the social services sector. Just before I hand it off to them, I did wanna point out the chat bar at the bottom of the screen. We invite your questions. There will be a question and answer period after the presentation. And we'll, if you have a question that bubbles up during, you're welcome to type it in there. Um, so without further ado, I will change this over to Charlotte as our presenter. Just give me a moment. Oh, there. Hi, I'm not Charlotte. <laughs> Kendra. Sorry, but I, I need to go. Oh, there we go. Okay, perfect. Okay. Uh, so we wanted to talk a little bit about who is involved in this research project. Can everybody hear me? I'll just wait to see. Um, so Haliton Family and Community Services Society is a uh, child welfare organization in Victoria, British Columbia. We provide services to Indigenous communities both on and off reserve that um, are involved with the child welfare system in many different capacities. So we do counseling, sexual abuse counseling, child and youth mental health, uh, parenting assessment, um, parenting capacity, family preservation, reunification, um, supported access, uh, a plethora of services that support um, families to either reunite or um, preserve the family unit. We uh, provide our services uh, with the intention of, or sorry, we provide our services with culture at the center. Um, so we say that our, our uh, programs are culturally rooted, uh, which is a crucial piece to doing this work way that we feel is a crucial piece to doing this work in a good way. So um, Leighton was involved 
Uh, the other agencies that were involved are organizations, Center for Indigenous Research and Community-Led Engagement, CIRCLE, UFIC Re Research Services, um, they do research partnerships and knowledge mobilization, so actually they connected us to the Center for Indigenous Research and Community-Led Engagement. The Ministry of Children and Family Development, so that's our uh, Child Welfare Ministry in BC, and most importantly, the members of the Indigenous or Aboriginal community in this area. Um, we, uh, how it worked was, it was the Clayton had wanted to do a project, um, and UVic um, has a an agreement with the ministry. Um, and then UVic connects you with the appropriate research organization um, to do the work. So it, it was a really neat process because the, the research services really helped us to, um, to find the right research organization that would do the work in a way that we felt was ethical and um, uh, supported the knowledge transfer and the knowledge mobilization in a good way for the community. So that's why Circle was the the organization that was chosen, and that's how I met Dr. Lopi, <laughs> uh, who you'll see in a minute. Um, so the process of the research, and I'm speaking a little bit outside of um, my area of, of um, knowledge because uh, I don't, um, I'm not a professor. Uh, it was, we had a process where we wanted to do an environmental scan or a lit review first in, with trying to get an understanding of what was out there for, for families around um, uh, a cultural, ass an assessment tool that was culturally rooted and culturally based. Um, so the environmental scan was done across Canada and i just going to check with Charlotte, was it also done internationally? I think that there was a bit of an international scan as well where, where we looked at the Australia, New Zealand, places like that. Um, and then there was also a, in the lit review, uh, the findings in those were not very substantial. There wasn't a lot out there. Um, so, and many times you're doing um, indigenous-based programming, you're, you know, you are creating something because uh, there isn't a lot um, out in community at this point, which is also, which is in some ways a really exciting opportunity. Um, then part of that, so after the environmental scan, the lit review, what we did is we, we developed a tool. We had um, three different uh, Indigenous um, PhD students or master's students, master's level students working with us. Um, so Zach Miller and Sarah Kissinger worked on the environmental scan lit review and then Rochelle Donaldson um, helped with developing the tool um, with myself and members of the team at, at Haliton um, and Charlotte to uh, develop, to actually look at what would it look like. Um, Oh, um, so I was just saying, do you want to talk about why? And and I think that's a, a really important component. Um, so why we decided to take this journey together was uh, we felt that it was really crucial to create something that, uh, um, that supported families to be assessed on their parenting capacity, for lack of a better term, in a way that fit with a value system in an Indigenous worldview. Um, we, what our experience had been in Victoria and I think in this area is that um, assessment tools are done, they're very clinical, they're done by um, psychologists, so they're incredibly expensive, they occur within a period of five hours. Um, and those uh, tools determine whether or not a parent can often can be used to determine whether or not a parent has can have their children back or keep their children in their care. Uh, that's a lot of uh, power for one tool to have and a five-hour period of time. Um, we felt it really didn't um, didn't reflect the worldview of the community we serve. Um, many of the, well, the assessment tools were developed around um, 
mainstream culture. Uh, so therefore, they're already setting up families for failure many times, which is not beneficial for the community. So we. Um, and we wanted to take into consideration that our, you know, all children, Indigenous children, have the right to grow up in healthy, safe, um, protective environments. But those healthy, safe, protective environments need to reflect their worldview and the family they come from. So that was a crucial piece to, to going down this journey. Um, we also wanted to see, with an understanding, and I don't think this is anything that anybody in community isn't aware of at this point, that you know, Indigenous children are the highest number of kids in care across the country. Um, and in order to have children return to their family home, we need to be uh, assessing people's ability to care for their children based on how they show up in the world and their own worldview, as opposed to a worldview that reflects a mainstream culture that really was part of the reason why children ended up in care to begin with. Um, and it doesn't uh, change, you know, part of reconciliation or truth and reconciliation is, is recognizing that we need to look at our services and our programming differently, that we need to uh, acknowledge and honor a different way of being in this world. And, and that's a really crucial component to uh, success healthy and positive outcomes for families. Um, so, and we also think that, you know, our experience through uh, CRAF accreditation at Leeton is that if families are involved in their journey and it's their decision and they have a say, the, the outcomes are much more positive. And that may sound really um, elementary or, or uh, simple, uh, but unfortunately, that's not the way that uh, social services always do the work, and and so families are told what to do and are given, uh, you know, are, are are basically told how they need to be, and and again, we are continuing to traumatize and perpetuate a culture that does not does not uh, honor indigenous ways of knowing and being. So that's okay. 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 So. Um, how we developed, I just want to make sure I didn't miss anything. OK, so just a minute. Sorry. OK, that's right. So the tool was developed based on a set of values that we felt were really crucial to uh, showing up. And, and what we ended up doing is we, we decided to um, we decided to look at the structured decision-making tool that the ministry uses here, which is the assessment uh, strengths and weaknesses or strengths and needs assessment um, in addition to risk factors. Um, we looked at that and we compared it to how to our value, the values we chose, and how they would align themselves. So that, because at the end of the day, if the ministry is not on the board and the ministry doesn't see this as valuable, kids aren't going home. And we need kids to go home or to stay in their family home. So that was a, a an important piece that, that we all have a say in this. And we really did work um, in collaboration with the ministry on on this piece. Uh, they had people from leadership involved, they had social workers involved, they had uh, um, team leaders involved, so that it was, because at the end of the day, I wanted to I want something that's going to be useful. We want something that's going to be useful to community. Um, and we also wanted something that people doing the work could use, uh, because that minimizes cost, it speaks to the crucial component of relationship. Uh, relationship is everything. Uh, how do you determine how someone's able to parent or be a parent or be in this world if you don't have a relationship with them? Um, I think the biggest difference between, one of the biggest differences I've seen between Indigenous worldview and mainstream culture or non-Indigenous worldview is that um, relationship is so different. I think in the mainstream culture, we believe that there's a belief system that if you have neutrality, if you don't know that person, if you don't have a relationship with them, then your ability to assess who they are and where they're at is a, is much more um, honorable, yeah, credible, yeah. 
Um, but with an indigenous worldview, it's all about your relationship. I'm going to trust you if I know you. I'm going to trust you if I know your family, if I know where you come from, how you think, what you believe in. Uh, I'm not going to trust you if I don't know you. So that neutrality actually creates less trust and uh, is a barrier to the um, to the practice and to the ability to do this in a good way. Um, so relationship is the core of this tool. Uh, you can't do this in five hours. Uh, you have to have a ongoing relationship with the family in order to be able to do it in a good way. Um, something that I'm sure people are aware of is, you know, we all we all show up in this world sometimes having a bad day. Maybe we didn't sleep enough. Maybe we didn't eat enough. Maybe we had a fight with our partner. Maybe we um, got into a car accident. There's so many situations that can impact how we show up and how we present that having a relationship and understanding someone over a period of time gives them a much gives everybody a much better sense of who we are as people um so the other piece that uh and i don't want to take up too much time but the other piece that is important to understand is this these values that we have are connected to curriculum we've created at haleton through our kwan latel parenting program so basically what it does is the curriculum speaks to certain areas. Uh, there's, there's what we call um, the educational component and then an observation or a demonstration component. Uh, where So the, the educational piece is, uh, for example, if you look at the value of respect, we do a lot of work on what's self-care, what's respectful interactions. And the education is experiential. It's um, where people, so part of the assessment tool is to talk about what's your story. How did you experience respect in your life? Did you? What does that look like? Uh, and then how do you transfer that to your children? Uh, often in parenting programs or in assessment tools, we only talk about the interaction with the child. But how do you interact in a good way with your child if no one's ever taught you that or you've never experienced that in your life? Uh, so we, we take it a step back um, in the respect that parents need to understand that they are important and they're cared for. And in order for that to happen, for them to be healthy parents, their children, um, or sorry, they need to understand what that means and how that feels. Um, setting healthy boundaries is about courage. Uh, it takes a lot of courage to be able to say, no, that's not OK with me, or um, that doesn't feel good. Uh, often families are taught not to uh, have a voice. And even in the system, we take that from them. Uh, so we're trying to, to relearn that together, that um, having a voice is important. Uh, so then the other pieces are, um, as you can see, I know uh, I'm, they're on the, the um, screen. So we, we, we use those eight values, and we have two processes. We have their story and our journey, which is where we actually do the assessment. So we the education happens. We talk about what it looks like. We talk about their story, of, of how they reflect back into their own learning, because that's the other piece is information. We, we work with, with parents that have had a lot of trauma. And what happens when people have a lot of trauma is they can present really well and they re can regurgitate information, but they can't always connect it to their own story. And so often we see um, social workers saying, well, they, know, they say all the right things and, and um, so sometimes children go home and then they end up back in care. Uh, because that connection hasn't happened for the family. So what we do is we actually get them to connect it to their own story. When you can connect it to your own story, then it sticks. And then there's real learning and real ability to observe and demonstrate that learning uh, with their child, with themselves. So that assessment is done um, in a relational manner. OK. Um, so the participants in the study were clients of Haleton, so families that had either accessed the parenting program in the past or that were currently in the program. Uh, we wanted to get their sense of what that what their experience was. Um, Haleton family development workers, so those are, the, in our parenting program, we have what are called family development workers. They work directly with the parents over an 18-month period. 
um, senior managers. So the exciting thing about the senior management that were involved in this is one of the managers was um, actually was a family development worker in the Kwan Latell program in the past. So she not only had an experience doing the work as a family development worker, but also managing the program and what that looked like. And I also was one of those people that was involved and I, um, I was there from the conception of this program, uh, working with community when we developed it. It was on a grassroots level and community was involved in the development of the program and I've watched it grow over the years. Social workers uh, that refer, because this is a mandated or gate-kept program, so they refer to our program uh, that were, and when I say the program, it's because really it's the whole package in order to be able to do the assessment. And then team leaders. And a couple of the team leaders were actually social workers a few years ago that uh, referred to the program. So there was a real connection in many ways. Um, and you know, it, as you can see, the numbers there, some were a little bit higher. This is, uh, but um, the information was gathered. Um, it was a small group, but it was really important information. Um, so this is how we, we uh, what we ended up doing is we did a presentation prior to the interviews. Um, I would go in with the tool, kind of in a comparison of the old and the new. Um, do a presentation for an hour and then after that we left and the uh, PhD student um, Shane Keepness uh, did the interviews with with the families or the social workers or the um, family development workers so we weren't present at that point but we did do a presentation just so that there was some information that people could compare it to. Um, we also debriefed with family development workers over the period of around six months. We tried to pilot the um, assessment tool to get a sense of did it work with the program, what, were, what worked, what didn't work. So weekly I would meet myself and the manager would meet with the family development workers to have a conversation about how they felt. Um, about the data collection and what was working and what wasn't working and what were the families saying about it and um, yeah and I think that was all that was the process we went through uh, the interviews the the conversations again it was all relational because that was a crucial component to the work and I think now I'm gonna pass it to yeah pass it to Charlotte now so here's Charlotte Thanks, Kendra. Hi, everyone. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what came out of those interviews and focus groups with, uh, with all of those folks. Uh, but I just wanted to say before I start that it has been an absolute pleasure. Um, I just feel so honored to have been invited to work on this project with Huliton. Uh, it was a one-year project uh, that began uh, three years ago. <laughs> and, uh, and I think that's an important, um, it's one of the important things to say about community-based research is that the funders can put time limits on these things, but if we're doing this in a relational uh, way, an indigenous, uh, taking an indigenous approach to research, which is relational, um, then the, it is going to take the time that it takes. And I think that's a super important um, thing to, to, to know and to be comfortable with. And so uh, we, we feel good about a super uh, close working relationship as well as a friendship, that that's part of the process. Um, and so uh, that provides us with lots of opportunities to work together in the future and to connect um, with our other uh, with other relationships and share those relationships with each other. So, um, just wanted to, super grateful for uh, for the opportunity to have been involved in this amazing project. And I learned so much about um, about the system that I didn't know. It hasn't always been positive, but uh, but the process has been really positive. And um, so again, we uh, we ask people to reflect on the tool. Our, um, our uh, PhD candidate um, research assistant, um, Shane, who is a Cree man, uh, was really helpful in terms of uh, collecting that data and summarizing it. And so the way that we're presenting it to you is obviously not in its entirety because 
too long, uh, but we wanted to give you just some general reflections from each of those groups. And uh, by and large, they were very positive. Um, but there are a few. There were a few things that people uh, uh, mentioned that needed to be, you know, uh, at least considered moving forward. But you can see that overwhelmingly, the clients preferred the new tool. Um, it was easy to understand. Uh, they said it was very positive, uh, well laid out. Um, they felt as though they were being treated as a person rather than a client or a, a, an issue to solve. Uh, the fact that it was strength-based, um, you can see that from the, the description that Kendra gave you about values. Uh, there's nothing deficit um, about it, and that they found that very empowering. Just again, as human beings, uh, they thought that it provided an opportunity to have much better relationships with their workers. Um, they felt more engaged in the process. Uh, they felt like they could open up and their, their self-esteem was actually enhanced uh, by this process and, um, and that it actually set a more positive tone for the entire journey that they were taking with, uh, with the Huliton um, family development workers. And, um, and just partly because, they, the, because it has a, the tool has a positive tone, uh, they felt more positive about going through the, the process. And, um, and they felt that the relationship with the family development workers was positive because it actually helped them to engage more deeply um, in terms of those values. So that's great. Uh, and uh, so family development workers uh, thought that the wording, um, so again, the value statements represented a major improvement over the, um, over the former tool. Uh, they felt that it was much more respectful and inclusive of indigenous worldviews. Uh, they thought, again, they agreed with the clients that the, uh, the value focus was really going to strengthen their relationships with the clients in part because it was going to help to build trust. Um, they, they did say that um, you know, there is going to be generally a challenge in learning how to use the tool properly because they recognize that even when you have a really culturally relevant tool, um, you're not always necessarily going to change the way people see uh, clients. And so that's part of the process, right? And that's part of something that Huliton is taking very seriously, is already implementing ways to uh, ways to address those things, right? And so, um, but using the tool does make it much more difficult to be deficit focused, and it requires that the, that the workers um, take a, a slightly different approach in their assessment. And so as a result of, um, of engaging with the tool and as a result of those debriefing sessions uh, that Kendra mentioned earlier, um, the Huliton senior management felt that, again, the tool just provides a space to honor Indigenous experiences, uh, that the language, again, was very accessible, and that people uh, were able to connect with those value statements more than they were um, the the kinds of the kind of language that was used in the former tool. Uh, they felt that the um, there that it set the the tone for a much more collaborative uh, approach to healing and, and family reunification. Uh, they felt they felt that the language of the tool reflects the holistic practice in which they're trying to engage. It also facilitates. Um, the ministry workers um, in, in terms of understanding and learning about indigenous world views. And so um, the use of terms like humility, respect, love, and courage, uh, again, it makes it quite difficult to be deficit focused. And so there's learning in that. Uh, it definitely, they saw it as a, uh, a very positive step toward creating a more balanced relationship in terms of power with the ministry. And uh, it directly confronts some of the racist ideologies that are embedded in the this, in this system and many other systems, as we, as we all know. And so uh, when we spoke to the ministry workers, and so these are folks that work uh, for the Ministry of uh, Child and Family Development, uh, they are the folks who who receive these reports, 
based now on the new tool, uh, they felt that um, having you know reviewed the tool, they felt that this would actually help them to understand um, the clients that who Leeton is serving much better uh, in terms of connecting with uh, the information that's on these reports that they see because they don't get to see the clients. Um, but they also felt that uh, it promoted uh, trust and collaboration with the ministry and Huleton, uh, and they were really happy to see that um, that the the tool was still measuring uh, the indicators that were relevant to their assessment, and so uh, that's a really important uh, piece because if that hadn't happened, uh, there'd be there would be issues in terms of having to you know, re-examine how that tool can meet the needs of the clients, but also meet the needs of the of MCFD. Uh, they felt that, uh, again, it was very evidence-based and stable, stable in terms of it aligned well with their, um, with the indicators that they felt were important in terms of the assessment. And they, uh, looking at the tool, they recognized that the language of the new tool is much more accessible in terms of its language people use every day, which is going to be less confusing to clients, and it's going to foster better relationships. Because if people are feeling excluded by the language that's assessing them, of course, uh, they're going to feel excluded from the process, and they're not going to be building trust or good relationships. And it's great that the ministry um, uh, recognize that as well. And one of the things that they also pointed out, which uh, you heard um, Kendra talk about earlier, which is that it acknowledges the trauma that individual Indigenous people have experienced, but Indigenous people as a collective have experienced, and how that has impacted and continues to impact families and individuals. And so, well, that was quick. Uh, so uh, that was a, like an abrupt, oh, thank you. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to take uh, questions now. And so if you have a question, I think the process is that you type it or give it to Jessica. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, um, Charlotte and Kendra, for that presentation. It's really interesting meaningful work. Um, it's so good to hear about a process that has such good results. I'm, I'm, thank you for sharing with us. Thank you very much. Um, we are doing question answer stuff now, but if we, since we haven't had any during the presentation, I'll share a bit about CBRC while people put the, collect their thoughts and um, we'll engage with those questions as they come up. But um, for those of you who want a bit more information about CBRC, the coordinators of this webinar series, um, we encourage you to continue attending webinars like this one. Um, we'll have some links coming up about where you can sign up for them in the future. We have a cross Canada map, which um, includes folks from around the country. Um, you can connect with them. You can put yourself on the map, see who's doing what, where. Um, and we are looking for someone to host our C C2U Expo 2020. So we look forward to, to um, finding the the place for that to happen and to meeting some people face to face. Um, we do have a question that just came in. I will read it out, but then I'm going to take my mic off and you, Charlotte and Kendra can kind of take over. Um, so the question is, what was the role of the researchers? What was important to keep in mind when working with Indigenous, the Indigenous population? So I'll leave that to you and I'll just sign off my video and audio. Okay. Um... Can you hear me without my mic? Can somebody let me know whether I should put the mic back on? Oh, very quiet. There. Uh, I'm on. We're on my laptop, so it's not very. Uh, it's not very good. Three people are typing now. Thanks. Um, so. Uh, Again, as Kendra mentioned, we uh, at the time that we started this project, I was the director of Circle, and I was contacted by um, the uh, research facilitator at Dal, the community-based re research facilitator at Dal, to say that there was an, an organization called Huleton that I hadn't heard of before. Uh, they were interested in uh, a small piece of research that was going to be funded uh, through the ministry. 
uh, by way of the ministry. And um, would someone like to help them with that? And so that's definitely my process um, individually is not to seek out research partnerships with communities, but to respond to requests by communities to be engaged. And so the role of the researchers here, myself, uh, and the Indigenous students that were engaged as research assistants was to provide a service to the community, uh, not to be in charge, not to make um, uh, uh, decisions for them. Uh, Huliton, it, this was a Huliton project. Uh, we had several meetings, and again, the time we spent doing that um, ensured that this was a community-based and a community-led uh, project. I would say, um, do you want to speak to the importance of doing that with Indigenous peoples, or do you want me to? Or I guess, I guess I would say, just as as an Indigenous researcher, that it's critical that researchers understand that um, this kind of research uh, should be, uh, in my mind. Um, thought of as a service to community. And so that we we don't come in with our own agenda. We don't come in feeling as though we're experts in any way. We have a specialized skill set, like my dad, who was a diesel mechanic. And that's the way I see myself. I have a, I have a specific skill set that can be of use to community if that's what they want. And so because Indigenous folks have been, and communities have been exploited for so long, uh, in research, uh, have been damaged uh, by researchers, have had information that was critical to uh, meeting their needs taken away and used purely for an academic uh, career building. Uh, that it's it's critical that we uh, that we do something in a very very different way and that we that we act in service. I think that's probably the most. That's the most important thing. Can you do you want to do? Yeah. Kendra's going to say something. Hi. Every time I, well, I might be aging myself, but every time I put this thing on, I think of um, the Carol Burnett. No, I'm um, oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, the Carol Burnett. Hello. Or, um, anyway, uh, so, yeah, and I agree with everything Charlotte was saying. I also, um, I think that's the piece, what she ended with was that, there needs to be a, I think when doing community-based research, how is this going to benefit the community? Uh, not how is it going to benefit yourself. Like even, even Haliton doing this work, uh, doing this assessment tool, it wasn't about getting our name out there. It wasn't about, um, you know, creating something that everybody was going to know about. It was about how could this benefit the people we serve now and and of course at the end of the day i hope it benefits many many more uh because i that's that's really at the end of the day the the most important is that children are going home to safe communities healthy families the next generation is healthier uh this has a legacy for community not for haliton uh because we're here to serve as well we're in service to our community um so, you know, I was having a conversation this morning with someone about this, and, and they said, you know, this is huge. And I said, yeah, I guess I don't really think about it that way. We don't think about the, the, the magnitude of it. We just, this is something that will help the people we serve. And so I guess if you go into research with the same values that we talked about with humility and courage, um, respect, love, all those same values. Uh, if we can use those same values in our in our research that we do in our work, um, then it's done in a good way, and and people benefit. Let me pass it back. Oh, I'm supposed to leave it on. There's some people typing, so we're just waiting. I don't know if we're still on it. Oh, there we go. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I look at those values, and I think, yeah, what a what a great way to look at how you do your research. Um, 
I think if we, oh, sorry. So uh, to answer that question, the tool was developed by Halitin, um, the research student. Um, it was myself, the family development workers, um, uh, our elder and resident, um, and uh, members of that had accessed the services had a say, had some some say in it as well. So it was a collaborative process. Uh, we developed the tool because we're doing the work, and we know. Um, uh, and, and that's really what it came from, is we wanted to know really how this, this whole thing started was we wanted to develop a tool that was beneficial, that w came from an Indigenous worldview, that reflected the values and needs of the, the people we serve, that helped to get kids home um, using language that honoured um, the people we serve's cultural uh, diversity and backgrounds as opposed to mainstream. And then we said, okay, is there anything else out there? Is this actually happening? And that's kind of where the, where the whole concept of the research came out. So it was like, is there anything? Is it working? Um, because we also thought, if there's something out there that's already working, why reinvent the wheel? Um, but what we found is there really wasn't anything out there. So then it was like, okay, this is our first, you know, opportunity to do something. Like I said, I don't know how um, beneficial it's going to be to everybody else, but I really hope it'll be beneficial to our families and transfer. Um, all the researchers. Okay, I'm going to pass this part to Charlotte. <laughs> Hello, let me talk about rigor. Um, and so um, we uh, we had uh, this uh, project went through a series of um, applications to uh, the the University of Victoria's uh, uh, Human uh, Research Ethics Board, and so. Uh, as most, if you're a researcher, you know that uh, ethics boards take a very close look at um, how people are engaging uh, in with with community members and with individuals in terms of their safety. Um, we we also, of course, uh, recognize that um, we have to be protective of the cultural safety. Of um, of indigenous people when they're engaging with us, and so I'm uh, as I'm talking, I'm looking, uh, I'm I'm trying to pull up the research questions because we had a series of research, uh, we had a series of questions, uh, which was again. So this is a pilot test. This is not um, an impact test. So an impact test means um, how well you know does the tool. Um, do what it's supposed to do, right? And that you have to do over long period of time, right? So this was a pilot test of the actual tool, and so again, the 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 tool was developed. Um, yeah, uh, the tool was developed uh, by Huliton with input from clients, from elders, from knowledge holders who are uh, who are from this area who can speak to that as well as drawing from the values that um, that were recognized in terms of the, the, the review of literature. And so how that exactly happened, uh, the researchers weren't, were not involved in that because that's that's Huliton's business and that's our job was to ask specific questions about the tool so that the tool could be modified or revised uh, to make sure that it was doing uh, what it was intended to do, and so uh, and so in terms of questions, um, we uh, we asked questions of clients uh, such as you know uh, what kinds of we these are open ended questions they're in interview style and so what kinds of differences did they see in the tools um, how how the wording uh, might impact their relationship with the uh, family development workers uh, what benefits or challenges they saw with the new tools for them and then how if at all might the new uh, tool impact 
uh, the assessments that they were uh, that they were undertaking uh, or th that were being undertaken about them. Uh, we asked Leeton family development workers uh, to describe uh, what they felt were some of the characteristics of the tool that they felt were important. Uh, to describe any observed um, uh, perceptions of the parents' response to the tool, um, if they uh, noted any differences uh, between the, the past tool and the current tool, uh, the benefits and challenges again, uh, questions about language and relationship with clients, um, if the tool, it, how and if at all, did the tool impact their assessing uh, assessment reporting, um, how it might reflect uh, Chapter 3 and Section 13 of, of their accreditation um, uh, framework, and how it might reflect the recommendations of the, of the TRC. Uh, we asked uh, similar questions, um, I won't go into each one, but similar questions of the, the Hulet and Senior Management as well as the, the um, family development um, social workers and uh, team leaders at the Ministry of uh, Health. Uh, we also asked them things about, you know, uh, how this might uh, impact their assessment reports that they are the assessment reports that they receive from Huleaton. So things that um, were very specific again to the tool itself, uh, with the uh, with with the idea of uh, making sure that the tool is doing what it was intended to do, and then if Huleaton, um is interested in uh, pursuing um, a uh, future research that looks at the impact of the tool um, in terms of you know outcomes then that's something that we'll that we can talk to them about uh, but yeah so in terms of rigor uh, it's uh, that's a that's it's language that we are sometimes don't use a lot in the community-based research we do but in terms of the um, validity of the tool, if that's I think what the person is um, is talking about, then uh, the tool was um, uh, was reviewed by uh, the entire research team, the Huleaton team. Uh, it was reviewed by the ethics board, and uh, and so um, it was based on I guess you would say face validity. those questions I see anyone come in and we're nearly at the one hour mark so I think that we can we can end things off unless um, either you Kendra or Charlotte had any final words that you wanted to share with us um, did we miss asking a question we should have asked <laughs> we're good okay excellent well I will take you guys off of video then okay. And off of audio, there you go. So um, it feels wrong to not applaud, but thank you so much um, both for the presentation and for thoughtfully answering the questions that were asked. Um, oh boy, now I see someone else typing. If you have a question, you can let us know. Um, oh, there we go. Th thank you from Jody, of course. Um, just so you all know, at, uh, when I end this webinar, there will be a feedback questionnaire that pops up. We would appreciate hearing back from you about anything we could improve or something you particularly appreciate. Um, but just thank you so much to our presenters and um, we look forward to seeing all of you in future webinars and uh, hope you have a good day ahead. Thank you so much. <laughs>